In April 2007, uh, you know, at the end of the drought or in the middle of the drought, conditions were very poor in the, in the forest and the decision was made by the agencies, which was Parks Victoria and DSC at the time, that cattle were to be removed from the forest. And we realised then that we didn't have any real mechanism of or benchmark of determining when and if cattle should be reintroduced to the forest. And that's when the idea of a, um, some benchmarks were arrived at. And the agencies and the cattlemen agreed that we need to have some sort of measurable benchmark to, uh, to be met before cattle could be reintroduced to the forest. So in October 2007, uh, agency staff, as well as the cattlemen, uh, came up with a biomass assessment of the forest uh, to assist with uh, deriving these benchmarks, which can then be used as a tool to, uh, to guide our decision making regarding cattle grazing. So we established seven transects across the, the forest on a range of understory types. There were three types of transects. They were either dominated by palatable species, that's palatable to cattle, uh, they, were either, or they could have been weedy or they also may have had little understory. So there's a range of types of transects that we measured. We randomly selected the starting point of each transect and within each transect we measured 10 quadrants and each quadrant was a 25 by 25 centimetre by 25 centimetre uh, size. This is an example of one of the quadrants that we measured. We, at the quadrant, we measured the height and percentage cover of the biomass, and then we cut the biomass from each quadrant, ba uh, bagged it and weighed it green, and then we amalgamated all the biomass for the 10 quadrants for each transect, and put that into a single bag, dried it and weighed it. And the palatable dry biomass for each quadrant was then calculated by applying the ratio of green biomass for that quadrant to the total bag green biomass for that transect, and then multiplying by the rate of drying for the bulk 10 quadrants. Now this calculation obviously assumes that each of the 10 quadrants per transect contain the same percentage of moisture. In general, the dry biomass ended up being roughly half to a third the uh, amount of green biomass. Then we undertook a regression analysis of the data to generate a relationship between height and cover, which we're actually measuring on the site, and the actual biomass. Uh, as biomass is a volume measure, we thought that a linear relationship between biomass and multiplying cover and height would be the way to go, and we ran that through the computer and came up with a relationship and that's the relationship up there on the screen, and we're reasonably happy with the, uh, the relationship, that linear relationship. So what that means now is when we're out in the field, all we need to do is measure height and cover of the predominant species on the ground, and we plug it into this formula and we come up with a biomass. Now that biomass, I should stress, is dry, dry matter. I neglected to put that on the axis there. So, as I mentioned earlier, cattle were not reintroduced after they were removed in April 2007, so the initial rationale for undertaking the biomass measurement was no longer relevant, but we made a decision to continue the monitoring and I think it's come up with some pretty good results since. So as I said, we're, we're doing that uh, height and cover measurement uh, every autumn and every spring of each year. Today's presentation, I really want to focus on the biomass response to flooding of the forest after the drought. As I said, we've got a number of different landscape units in the forest that we measure. I'll start from the lower ones first. This is the marshes, this is an example of the marshes landscape unit. The top photo shows the, this is at Hut Lake, the top photo shows what the site looked like uh, in the middle of the drought, 2008 and the figure in red indicates we've only got 0.2 tonnes per hectare, so you know, very low biomass. 
The bottom photo is after we've had significant flooding, November 2011. The whole site's become uh, flourishing in mora grass, good cover, good height in 20 centimetres of water and it's generating 1.7 tonnes per hectare. So there's been a good response to the mora grass at this site from flooding. The next landscape unit is the riverine swampy woodland landscape unit. So it's basically red gum that does receive uh, a lot of floods. And this is a, it's basically three, uh, it's probably two zones in this, in this landscape unit. There's the lower zone that gets a lot, has received a lot of flooding over the last two years. Uh, this is an example of Bucks Lake. The top photo is once again in the middle of the drought, October 2008. Very low biomass, 0.1 tonnes per hectare. And then the bottom photo is in May 2012. That's one month after the flood has receded. And there's virtually no biomass whatsoever. So there's a bit of knotweed just germinated. That's what gives it that green tinge. But you know it's virtually pointless putting that, um, that value into the regression analysis. There's virtually nothing, nothing there. And people that spend a lot of time in the forest in the last couple of years would have seen this type of phenomenon across the forest where there's been long-term flooding and it's now receded under the red gums. There's very little biomass. There's a lot of litter but, but nothing uh, much growing. As you go up the profile slightly, uh, this is a site at Tama. Once again, top photo, October 2008 pre-flooding. Uh, we've got 0.2 tonnes of hec per hectare of dry matter, a combination of warrego, summer grass and cardamine, and that is basically dry biomass. There's not much growing there at all. There's a little, little bit of green tinge, but not a lot. May 2012, this is uh, similar to the previous photo. It's, it's one month after the flood has receded, but the vegetation has responded a lot quicker, and we've got a combination of rush sedge, warrego, summer grass and swamp dock germinating, 6% cover, 15 centimetres of height, and that uh, produces 0.1 tonnes per hectare of dry matter. The next zone within that riverine swampy woodland landscape unit is at the upper end of it. It's, it's received flooding over the last few years, but uh, the bottom photo is basically being taken one year after the flooding has receded and you can see the response of the rush sedge there, it's been phenomenal. Uh, it's basically doubled in biomass from the top photo, one tonne per hectare in the top photo and it's increased to about two tonne per hectare in the bottom photo. This type of zone that I'm showing you here now is, is probably the most widespread zone in the forest at the moment. Uh, most of the entrances you go in now, you'll come across this type of zone, a lot of green rush sedge and this, this photo here of two tonnes per hectare can actually get a lot higher than that, can get up around the three mark from some of the sites that we've measured. The riverine grassy woodland red gum landscape unit is higher again and even though we've had widespread flooding over the last few years, very little of this zone has received much, if any, flooding and the response of this zone has predominantly been due to the rainfall and we, you know we've obviously had good rainfall over the last few years which has caused the, uh, the understory to respond. Uh, top photo, middle of the drought, virtually no biomass at all, 0.01 tonnes per hectare. Bottom photo, similar type of uh, time of year but four years later we've started to get a, a green tinge coming through from that rainfall uh, response. Still very low though, 0.1 tonnes per hectare. Uh, for the sake of balance, we need to go to a, uh, a weedy site, and this is at Mill Log Landing. This is predominantly, um, this site's predominantly exotic grass. Uh, even in the drought in October 2008, it was still getting um, good, uh, there was good response to the vegetation from probably groundwater being feeding into it from the river. It's only probably 100 metres from the Murray River here, so we're suspecting that growth is due to uh, groundwater. But it has 
responded exceptionally well to the rainfall that we've had in the last couple of years and the bottom photo was taken in October last year. We're up around the three tonnes per hectare dry matter, 80% cover of exotic grass and 40 centimetres height. And right at the top of the spectrum, we've got the Plains Woodland Landscape Unit. This is basically the box ridges within the forest. And once again, the response of this landscape unit has predominantly been due to rainfall and the good rainfall that we've had over the last few years. Uh, during the drought, we only had 0.05 tonnes per hectare and now we, it's still a low biomass, 0.4, but it has significantly increased since we've uh, had that breaking of the drought. I've just got a summary table now of the actual biomass uh, calculations that we've applied right across the forest based on the 36 landscape uh, unit sites that we've measured. And you can see that for all the landscape units, they have increased uh, since the breaking of the drought. Just mindful, some of them are due to flooding and some of them are due to uh, rainfall. So even though I showed you those sites of red gum where they, there was virtually no response in the river and swampy woodland forest, um, that still has significantly increased in biomass across the, the entire spectrum of that landscape unit. It's gone from 0.36 in April 2010 to 0.91 in October 2012, and that's 48% of the forest contains that landscape unit. So in summary, the bottom line there of that table, uh, the forest in April 2010 was carrying roughly 0.36 tonnes per hectare, and October 2012 was carrying almost one tonne dry matter per hectare. Just want to recognise there's huge variation between the sites within a landscape unit, and some of those slides probably indicated that. Whilst uh, the original impetus for this project was for cattle grazing, and that no longer occurs, the biomass measurement still has a range of uses for the land manager. Uh, if we can use it to input into a determination of fuel load, we often get hammered in the in the media about you know the fire hazard out of Barmer, but I think these figures at least uh, are a, a measurable um, attribute of how much actual fuel is out there. And if, if you look at the DSE fuel load assessment guide uh, at a statewide level, you know, 0.94 tonnes per hectare is actually a very low fuel load in a forest type. Uh, the other thing is the uh, uh, biomass assessment is also a good measure of productivity at a site. And in, in, in the, my final comment, I'd just like to say I uh, appreciate the help of a couple of my colleagues here in the room that have helped me with this project over the years. Rolf Weaver over there and Jeff Carboon. Where are you, Jeff? Up the back somewhere. Yeah, right, right at the back. So uh, thanks to my colleagues. We'll be continuing, or well, hopefully continuing, to undertake this, um, this type of project in the future. And I've just had a word to Rolf, and he's helping, he's, he's offering to help out. Um, as a volunteer basis now that he's no longer on the payroll. So thanks very much, Rob.